do our stomachs shrink in the air as well? When you get your airplane food, it's so small. I know that when I see, having said that, yeah, when, when they're oh, chicken or fish or vegetarian or pasta, or whatever, you know, yes, thank you. And it's so small, but yet I'm so full. So I don't know, probably to delve into that further, thinking about things, what's taste, perception and smell and everything when people are in space, astronauts, what does the food taste like to them? Is it tasty? Science, science, technology, technology, medicine, medicine, health, health. These four things make the world go round. Without them, we couldn't exist. This is the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health. Answering your questions or finding experts in the field to answer them. Your host is a pharmacist, an award-winning scientist. She leads her own research group and is the founder of King's College London Fight the Fakes. A tad bit on the qualified side. Welcome to Monday Science. Here's your host, Dr. Bahija Rimey Abraham. Hello, everybody. Happy Monday, happy day, happy minute, happy hour, happy whatever day you are listening to this episode. I'm really excited today. If you are watching on YouTube now, okay, before I make the statement I was about to make, long time Monday sciences, I thank you for your support. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your tolerance of my promises of video content, not always manifesting and coming to fruition. Many reasons for that, not going to go into it now, but Whichever way, this episode is available on YouTube. You can go to YouTube, type Monday Science, and hopefully Monday Science should be the first hit, maybe, I hope. I don't know anything about SEOs or whatever those things are called. Whichever way, hello, I'm actually waving. Yeah, I'm coming across, I'm a thousand years old, but I am waving to those who are watching on YouTube. Obviously, I can't see you, but I know you can see me. So, hey, how are you? It's been so hectic. And, you know, I I have wondered how much of my life do I share on this podcast? Because it is meant to be about things that are interesting in science, tech, health. But uh, sometimes, you know, part of that is just managing oneself as an academic and as a scientist. What have I been up to? I did the COVID vaccine training. Shout out to Dee, who is the amazing trainer. So I had actually been on this since last year, trying to do the training, the COVID vaccine training for healthcare professionals. You have modules. For those who don't know, I'm a pharmacist. Then I went on to do a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences. And since qualifying in, wow, I qualified ages ago, 2008, I have always locum. Locuming is when it's acting. So you work in a pharmacy for a day, maybe two days, but it's an ad hoc thing. So I've been doing that over the years. I've always kept up to date with my pharmacy practice. And, you know, at times that's come in, not even at times, I was about to say at, at times it's come in useful. No, I'm a pharmacist first before everything else, I would say. And so my focus, even as it relates to my research group, Fight the Fakes, is the patient first and patient needs. And, you know, I'm very proud to be a pharmacist. Any pharmacist listening, hey, how are you? Keep going, power through. That sounded a wrap, but it wasn't meant to be. Yeah, so I I have, yeah, I've always been locoming. So that's mainly been in community pharmacy. When I saw the opportunity to be able to upskill as a pharmacist by doing the vaccine training, but also being able to contribute and support the oh sorry I'm in the UK for those who can't tell from my accent actually having said that just because I have a British accent doesn't necessarily mean I'm in the UK but I am in the UK so for those in the UK we have our vaccine program and I just wanted to be able to contribute and went through the COVID-19 vaccine training so that's been really good it has theory and practical elements so I had modules that I had to go through and then once I went through that phase then I've had the practical in-person training how to administer the COVID-19 vaccine and then additional training life life support and phylaxis hopefully I'll soon be assigned to the vaccine center and be able to support the efforts there. So that's been really great. I went to the Controlled Release Society annual meeting, which was in Montreal, Canada. I was an invited panelist and the panel session was a special event on scientific outreach. This was along two other panelists, Dr. Fi Schroeder, who's an associate professor at the Israel Institute of Technology, and Dr. Kate Whitehead, who's an associate professor at Carnegie 
Mellon University. This whole session was chaired by Zaf Zinger, who's an assistant professor at Israel Institute of Technology. Really interesting experience. Let's talk about the conference. So if anybody follows me on Instagram at Hija Raimi A, in fact, all my social media is that same tag. You saw that I, I've started, let's, let's hope and pray for consistency here, but I have started doing, posting my top tips on every Wednesday on different things. So I posted top tips on scientific outreach inspired by being a panelist at this event, the special event on scientific outreach. And being invited to, to speak at such an international and prestigious event was a, a massive honor. And to be invited to talk about scientific outreach, which you know, wasn't in the past maybe seen as something of importance and, you know, wasn't necessarily recognized as an essential activity that each scientist should do. And I'm always using the term scientist because scientists can be in academia, industry, regulatory, and so forth. So, you know, it really, you know, it's really about how do you communicate your science, whatever it is you're doing, not only to other scientists, but to the public, to people in other sectors and so forth. So with the other panelists, we were talking about our experiences, conduct Conducting scientific outreach. It was my first international conference since 2019. Even 2019, I don't remember where I traveled to, but 20, I can't remember. I think 2019, I was in Malaysia for a biomaterials conference. And then 2018, I traveled a lot. I was, and that was more for collaborations in Nigeria. Attending the CRS was my first international conference since 2019. And it was really good. It was really nice to get out, talking to people about science, talking to people about their work, being inspired by other people's work as well and their efforts and just to see really good science that is that had been ongoing despite in spite of the the pandemic and and other things Canada in general has a, a special place in my heart but more specifically Montreal because that's where my maternal grandparents met so my grandmother on my mom's side is from Trinidad grandmother from my dad's side was Nigeria and so they met at McGill University where grandma studied physiotherapy and my granddad studied engineering mechanical engineering I believe so I was so excited to have this sort of dual opportunity one first international conference since 2019 and then to get to go to Canada to see where my grandparents met there's a show in the UK called who do you think you are where people trace their heritage I think it's also in America as well and I really felt that's what it was for me so I, I visited McGill en route to visiting McGill I got to stop off and see where my grandparents got married because they got married in Canada Canada, Christchurch Cathedral, which was beautiful. I cried as I walked in. I was like, it's beautiful. So that was nice. And then McGill, you know, one of the top universities in the world, well known. So that was really, it was a really great experience. And then afterwards, I went on a street art self street art tour one of so for me one of my favorite pastimes going to a new city is to understand uh, to understand the street art culture in that place and in, in the country as well things around their legalities so i remember when i went to australia for a conference a few years back and just learning about how australia you know australia's view on street art in a very broad sense and the legalities and the fact that there are specific streets or specific areas that are dedicated to street art that street artists can they're legally allowed to produce their art but if they do it anywhere else it's yeah and another interesting place is america in terms of how somebody would get in trouble depending on where they post their art so if it's on a post box i believe that's federal law if it's on the sidewalk it's just fascinating so these are the things i do in my spare time what i tend to do is i will look a mixture on of just a general internet search just to see where the key areas are and then I'll also look on social media as well and just try and get a feel for the artists which artists what their styles are what I should look out for I always look for an invader I don't know if anybody knows the artist invader he does these little space invader tiles and, and pieces of work so I always try and look for an, an invader piece but I didn't find any in Montreal I'm sure there are, there are some because invader creates his artwork and then puts it anywhere he visits I believe he's from France so there's loads in Paris if I remember correctly I've got completely off topic but anyway that's what I did so I loved Montreal yummy food so what else has been going on okay well in the Rami Abraham group we've got two new PD researchers Amalia and Dee you can find out more about them on our website www.therimeabrahamgroup.com 
www.thegreatdoctorbook.com. And uh, they start in June. It's been really great to have two new members to the team. Last week, we went on a group trip to the Gordon Museum. The Gordon Museum, it's actually King's Gordon Museum of Pathology, is the largest medical museum in the UK and can very rare, unique artifacts, including the Lister antiseptic spray, original specimens of kidney, renal, there's so many things, lymph nodes, there's just so many things. And it was led by Richard Bright, Thomas Addison, Thomas Hodgkin to describe medical conditions that bear their names, but there's so much in there. When I first proposed this to the group for us to go, in all honesty, I was just trying to think of another way to, because King's College London has so many campuses and, uh, oh, this would be a good way for us to see a new campus. When we got there, it reminded me that actually this would be a good way because I knew what was going to be there, but I didn't, I couldn't remember if they had the specimens as it related to infectious diseases, which is a prime, the primary focus of, of the work in my group. And uh, when we got there, Bill, who is amazing, gave us this amazing introduction and we were able to ask, oh, would you have any around tuberculosis, malaria, particularly liver stage malaria? And he did. We learned so much. So because the museum encourages learning from the past in order to impact positively on contemporary and future healthcare developments. The museum is under the, it's, governed under the Human Tissue Act. And so, you know, it's a very respectful place. And yeah, it was just a real honor and privilege to have access to that because it has already, even just from the, the visit, it wasn't even sure we were there for maybe two and a bit hours, but it has already informed how we're viewing our science, how we're viewing our focus and our work. So yeah, it was really good experience. But yeah, I mentioned I was on, I was on a plane. Obviously I was on a plane to get to Canada. Yeah. It's the heat. I don't know. I really hope that this is recorded well because I've got the fan. Oh, put it in there. I'm sure you're not meant to do that when recording podcast episodes, but yeah, I've got this fan on because it's so hot. For those who don't know, was it this week just gone Monday and Tuesday the UK was the hottest as this saying the hottest since records began but actually it was the hottest I think it's ever been of a decade or a century I can't remember temperatures on Monday getting as high as 37 I, I want to say and then on Tuesday going as high as 40 degrees I was saying I obviously flew to Canada recently and somebody I was sitting next to on the plane we were just I don't know how it came up but he was talking to me about flavor and how our taste perception when we're in the air is completely different to how it is when we're on ground I'd never thought of it it makes sense when we talk about flavor it's from the from the pharmacy pharmaceutics designing of medicines then we think about smell and taste particularly taste a taste perception when designing medicines for children pediatrics and older people and so there's a something called an electronic tongue and a former colleague at UCL Catherine Tulu also has a rat model that she uses to evaluate taste there's as mentioned the electronic tongue there's also an electronic nose and these are analytical techniques used to evaluate taste and smell I don't know much about the smell and the electronic nose but I do know a little bit about the electronic tongue and it using a quinine standard and for sweet usually using a sucrose standard so it's how bitter is something relative to quinine. Quinine is Yes, it's used as an anti-malarial, but it's also used for cramps. It's also in tonic water. And so we've got bitterness, quinine, sweet, sugar, so sucrose. And then there are other tastes. So they're salty, of course, but we don't tend to evaluate for saltiness when we're making medicines. So generally is how bitter is it? Because most people don't like bitter things. Having said that, I do love tonic water with gin. Can I say that? I said it. But, but most drugs tend to be bitter. That's actually the main issue. They tend to be very bitter. And so the least masking strategies of a bitter drug could be masking it with a sweetener so that's where you'd evaluate the sweetness or giving it no flavor at all no taste which could sometimes be better because is it better to have an averse bitter taste or an averse sweet taste or just have no taste at all and if I remember correctly with taste we have taste buds in our mouth but then we also have taste buds in or taste receptors I think I call them taste buds in the stomach so that's why when when evaluating for medicines you look and see if there's an aftertaste with that because that could be the taste of the medicine after it's been after the coating has come off and then it's actually taste the patient's tasting it and stomach in a way yeah I'm sure somebody with more expertise can come and explain it but that's the that's the short short version there's another taste called umami that 
when I when I look at so I actually teach about this in second year pharmacy second year pharmacy students but um, is soya sauce I always get confused if they're five senses or if they're seven because there's a school of thought that there's the five and then the school of thought, thought that there's seven so yeah so that's it about taste anyway bringing it back to my flight so this person was telling me about how taste is different in cabin so I actually looked into this and I will be honest with you I've always wondered why when I'm eating the, the you know cabin food things that I wouldn't normally eat I'm ooh, so tasty so yummy and so for example I don't really when it comes to dessert I only really chocolate based dessert chocolate vanilla at a push salted caramel it's not such a push I do salted caramel but I, I really don't fruit and chocolate I can't handle that I, I don't at all but I don't tend to I mean I do apple crumble but I don't really tend to citrusy dessert but when I'm on a pl- when I'm in a plane in a plane on a plane in a plane when I'm in a plane or when I'm you know flying somewhere and they bring the lemon crumble I'm oh yeah mentally initially I'm Ugh, no but then I have a sniff and it actually doesn't seem too bad and I'll taste it anyway I'm waffling on our taste buds and sense of smell first thing to go when we're over 30,000 feet and then also as we're flying humidity is less and so that combination of dryness and low pressure reduces the sensitivity of our taste buds to sweet and salty food flavor is viewed as a combination of saltiness and sweet but that's a in a general sense I believe flavor is a combination of the the taste and smell when I had COVID I had a really weird scenario where I was eating a mango and I knew I was eating a mango because I saw the mango it was a fresh a fresh mango real mango you know not not to say chopped mango isn't real but it was real mango and then when I when I went to smell it it smelled of garlic it was the weirdest thing I was like, why is this smelling of garlic? And then when I went to taste it, it didn't really taste of anything. So I knew I was eating a mango because I could see it was a mango. It didn't really taste of anything, but it smelled of garlic. It's weird. Yeah, flavor, perception of, of sweet and saltiness generally is, is reduced when we're flying. When we're flying, sour, bitter, spicy, umami, those flavors are unaffected. And then there's also another school of thought that the noise that the jet engines produce could also further impact the tongue. I don't know much about this but apparently loud noises could or can also interfere with your taste preferences and so can even have an impact on inhibiting sweet and enhancing our perception of imami flavors then one of the things i would understand is is there something around our do our stomachs shrink in the air as well when you get your airplane food it's so small i know that when i see having said that yeah when when they're oh, chicken or fish or vegetarian or pasta or whatever you know, yes thank you and it's so small but yet I'm so full. So I don't know, probably to delve into that further, thinking about things, what taste, perception and smell and everything when people are in space, astronauts, what does the food taste like to them? Is it tasty? You've been listening to the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine and health we hope you've gotten some useful and thought-provoking info from the show and we hope you had fun along the way we know we did we'll be back soon but in the meantime hook up with us on our website at www.mondaysciencepodcast.com shoot us an email at info at mondaysciencepodcast.com Find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Monday Science. And access episode summaries at mondayscience.medium.com. See you next week on the Monday Science Podcast.